Depict Fashion makes women's clothing for Katie's stores with a workforce of 371 people. This morning, 71 staff were retrenched effective immediately. At the moment, uh, the state of the industry uh, in, this in this country is uh, um, very, very bleak. We are not alone, not the only company that's been forced to take this measure. This is a labour intensive industry. Area manager Colin Herndon says his company, like many others, can't compete with labour costs in Asia. 30 garments can be made there for the same price as just one in Australia. The textile industry had been afforded some protection through tariffs. However, the federal government decided to gradually reduce these trade barriers. It gives all the people uh, the retailers in this country the opportunity to purchase merchandise cheaper than what can be manufactured in the country. Teams from schools and rowing clubs from the New England, Hunter and North Coast made the trip to Malpaz Dam for the inaugural rowing regatta. A full range of events were contested from mixed eights to schoolboy single skulls and women's and men's coxed fours. Some of it, especially the veterans event, has been uh, a very high standard. Um, other, we've ranged right from complete novices to uh, experts. Organisers say the carnival ran smoothly, but it wasn't without incident. More than one team was forced to take a dip in the dam's icy waters. The regatta is likely to become an annual event on Armidale's sporting calendar. I'd say it's been a success. We've had over 100 competitors from 15 different clubs and schools, and we'd like to make it an annual event. Uh, we would like to see more water in the dam. The mud here hasn't been so pleasant for the visitors, so we'll hope for plenty of rain next year. Kath Pope won the right to run loose in the aisles of the supermarket after winning a promotion run by the Kmart shopping plaza. So this morning at 10 o'clock, fellow shoppers were warned to clear the aisles and Mrs Pope set off on her shopping spree. 60 seconds later, she had two full trolleys of goodies, totaling $266. Uh, not very often I put in for these competitions at these sort of places. I think, oh, blah, there's too many in for it. And I just happened to make an extra effort coming up from Grace Brothers one Friday afternoon. It was drawn next day. I got into trouble when I got back because I was running late for my husband. <laughs> so when you had all that help, it was marvellous, really. I couldn't have got very much if I was on my own, really. But still, it was lovely and a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> Ancillary staff play a background role in day-to-day -day teaching, doing clerical duties and assisting teachers with class preparation. It's a job the Public Service Association says deserves more recognition. It's been uh, unrecognised for many years, uh, the value of the work that uh, the women do in the schools, and uh, I really think that's at the heart of this, this issue, is that they've never been uh, properly recognised for the work that they provide. 
There are about 3,000 ancillary staff, mostly women, working throughout the Central Coast, Hunter and Northern New South Wales. Meetings like this, linked by Sky TV across the state, voted to reject the Department of School Education's proposed salaries, job security and career options. The PSA says the rejection won't lead to an increase in industrial action, although similar meetings are expected if talks don't progress. Tom Hilston, NBN News. What better place to launch the stamps than in the heart of the nation's oldest commercial wine production area for Colburn in the Hunter Valley. The minister responsible for Australia Post, Bob Brown, brought the release to his home patch, planting vines at the Casual Arena complex and unveiling a plaque to mark the occasion. The wine industry, a value-added exporter, was long overdue to be honoured in stamps. It's a mature industry and an exciting industry and we think it's something that shows not only the beauty of Australia but the industry itself being so successful. There are five stamps in the new series, along with the Hunter, the other regions are the Barossa and Coonawarra in South Australia, northeastern Victoria and the Margaret River district of Western Australia. Mr Williams says that despite their functionality, stamps will never become austere. Besides, a lot of money is spent on them by people who never actually use them, collectors that is. We think we've got the responsibility to record the history of this country and show the beauty of this country. The Hunter Valley Vineyard Association is delighted that now stamps are joining wine labels as overseas ambassadors for our wine industry. The stamps really are a reflection of what's happening socially in the community, of our society generally, and uh, we're just delighted to see that uh, they are looking at Australian agriculture, particularly value-added agriculture, and what we're doing for agriculture around the globe. First day covers of the new issue will be available from Thursday. More than three and a half thousand people will use this office and according to Social Security Minister Neil Blewett that number will grow. The department shut down its Broadmeadow offices to transfer to Walls End and streamline operations. You're going to hopefully have less queuing by the way it's been organised. There are direct counter services and there will be private services. All of that should help to ease the stresses in the office, allow our clients uh, to get uh, much more quickly, hopefully, satisfied. The move has left CES services isolated at Broadmeadow, but Dr Blewett says that problem will be solved by 1993. Until the end of the year, we are outposting a DSS person in at Broadmeadow, and the CES office at Broadmeadow will be outposting the person here so we can maintain that cooperation. That short term, both offices will be located here by the end of the year. The 41-year-old nurse was alone in a meal room at the hospital about four this morning when a man walked in and allegedly attacked her. As a result of this confrontation, the nurse received a wound to her left chest which required suturing. After receiving treatment, the nurse was allowed to go home. Glen Innes and Inverell police launched a search for the offender and several hours later made an arrest. A 34-year-old uh, Glen Innes local man has been arrested and charged with 
breaking into and committing a felony and also with malicious wounding. The man is in custody and will appear in Inverell local court tomorrow. Quality of care involves treating the terminally ill. Until recently it's kept a low profile, even been neglected. Dr Stiansford believes the main reason for this, society's preference to avoid dealing with death. One person said I'm not afraid of dying but I wouldn't like to be there when it happens. But that means that I think we need to search for a new tradition and attitude to death. 50 million people die each year worldwide, 6 million of those from cancer. This combined with the increasing incidence of AIDS and an ageing population shows the emerging importance of palliative care. Historically, palliative care has been the mission of family, religious and community volunteers. Dr Stiansford says it's time that changed. It should definitely be part and parcels of any uh, health policy of every government. The doctor is encouraged by advancements being made in Australia. Australia is one out of less than 20 countries that have a clear cancer pain policy, for instance. Local evidence of this, the Mater Hospital's $4 million hospice. The 20-bed facility is expected to open later this year. The area will also become home to Australia's second and the world's fourth chair of palliative care. This will allow for the training of medical staff and research into this form of health care. This prototype robot being trialled at the C.W. Pope Research Centre is attracting international interest. Dubbed the pig, it's the result of 18 months research using a U.S. Gas Association grant of $200,000. The company wants a self-propelled machine that can travel through kilometres of gas pipeline and detect tiny cracks on the outside of the pipe. The pig uses a sound wave to scan the pipe in much the same way as doctors use ultrasound to examine unborn babies. The pig passed its first test today, locating tiny cuts on the outside of the pipe and relaying the discovery to the operator. The precise location of pipeline floors is a breakthrough in technology. It's um, a big improvement over anything exist that exists at the moment because um, the problem being is that um, pipeline operators don't know where these cracks exist and uh, if and when there is a failure. The savings may not only be in monetary terms, as yesterday's gas explosion in Texas demonstrates the potential for a catastrophe is always present, especially with heavier than air gas like LPG. The company is convinced that the pig will pass its next test on a natural gas line in southwest New South Wales. Kelvin Card is employed by the Pipeline Authority and represents the US Association. He says that the pig will fly to the United States for further tests. If it works well, it'll be a commercial application they can sell right around the world. Well, he come home from school and said that he's has been suspended for been uh, buying uh, mar marijuana at school but then there was no parents present when they was all interviewed in the office at the school, which I think parents should have been called in to that as soon as they was caught. This parent says his child was one of four Borrigal High School students suspended 10 days ago for allegedly being involved with selling marijuana. He claims others have been disciplined over the same incident. The parent says he received this letter from the school after his child had already been sent home. Despite what the letter states, the school's principal denied there's been any detected marijuana dealings or disciplinary action in the past couple of weeks. And the local police know nothing about the incident, saying they haven't been contacted by the school. I think the police should have been called into the matter and looked into the matter further to find out who was actually supplying the children with it. 
The Department of Education has set out guidelines for when students are found with illegal drugs. Our principals are asked to uh, inform the parents straight away. Um, the student is, is suspended and, and given over to the care of the parent or a guardian that's been nominated and then um, police are informed. Ms Joyce says while drugs could be found in all high schools, surveys indicate that cannabis usage among Hunter students is minimal. Around about 7% of school students in the 12 to 16 age range indicate that they use marijuana weekly. Senior Constable Tony Tamplin sees hundreds of suspended students each year and says of the illegal drugs, marijuana is the biggest problem. If it was available in, in the community, the people that sell the drugs, provide it, uh, don't really care who it is that's buying it and therefore it's available to all age uh, people, which would include some of our school children. And the Knights will be hoping for the same accuracy on Sunday at Carlaw Park against the Sea Eagles. A manly home game and with so many former Aucklanders in the lineup, the Morona Whites will start crowd favourites according to David Waite. Auckland I don't think is a neutral venue. Uh, all their New Zealand connection are from Auckland. Graham Lowe's from Auckland. We will not be the favourite sons in Auckland. Our New Zealanders are from Wellington. So it's a uh, New, New South Wales versus Queensland style thing or a Sydney versus Brisbane style game on the weekend and uh, I'm sure they'll add some spice to it. Manly were brought back to Worth by a desperate Penrith outfit last weekend and will be keen to get back on track while the Knights have opened the season in sensational fashion. Five points from a possible six and showing a new attacking flair along with their rock solid defence. And it's that area that will be under siege from the brilliant Sea Eagle backline. Most experts on, on rugby league will tell you that the teams that make it at the end of the year, not only can they attack but they also uh, figure in the top four or five in defence and at the moment we're very, ha very happy with how we've got out of the starting blocks. Making the Olympic team is a dream come true for Angela Mullins. She's worked long and hard to represent Australia at Barcelona. Her determination is an inspiration for many young people in Moree. In the immediate lead up to the trials in Canberra, Angela was training around six hours a day, a hard slog which is not unusual for swimmers of her standard. But being in the country, Angela is a long way from regular competition. In fact, she's the only person in the 33 member team Team to come from a rural area. Generally, the rule is that you know most of the team you know come from the city. It's it's pretty um, unusual to see someone from the country in there. Angela will be joining her old teammates Lisa Curry Kenny, Karen Van Wernham, and Susan O'Neill. It's the same team which won gold at the Auckland Commonwealth Games, and Angela is confident that performance can be repeated. I think basically we've got a, a chance of silver or bronze over there because the gold seems to be tied up with America unless something, you know, something goes wrong with them they get disqualified or something but the times they've done are really, you know, really awesome times. In Auckland, Angela missed the opening ceremony of the Games. There's no way that's going to happen again this time. So I'm really looking forward to, to marching the opening ceremony, it'll be a big buzz. Perella and the 23-year-old McMahon enthralled a crowd of almost 3,000 with Perella finally taking the tournament 21-19 in fading light after 32 tense ends. Perella appeared in total control leading 14-6 after 18 ends but McMahon roared back picking up 10 shots to 3 in the next 7 ends to trail 17-16. Perella's power driving was the difference with the Queenslander killing 4 ends when McMahon held shot bowl. The ride relives the great old days of the pioneers who took to the bush looking for new challenges. 
About 60 riders headed off from Hungerford Hill at Pakolban this morning on a journey that will take them through Singleton, Gundy, Tymore, Nundal and then Tamworth. But it won't be all hard work. The first leg took the riders through the vineyards. But ahead lies stock routes, mountain tracks, roadsides and private properties. All money raised goes to the NBN Telethon and also Riding for the Disabled, a group which gives young disabled children the thrill of riding a pony. While the glory may shine on the Hunters Coal heritage, the Mine Workers Federation says the industry's future is uncertain. Operations are closing and jobs are being buried. At the present time we've got 400 people unemployed. Yeah? And Mick Watson believes the prospects for Hunter Coal mining could go from bad to worse. Certainly there would be at least another four pits in danger. The union says it's fighting for the industry's survival. And that's the catchword for a $150,000 campaign launched today. Survival 92 is about saving jobs and making the community aware that a dying coal industry in the Hunter will affect more than just mining families. It's their jobs that are going to go as well. For every job we lose in the coal mining industry, we lose three and a half support jobs, which means uh, when we lose the 1,000 miners, which we could well do, we will also lose three and a half thousand other workers as well. Marie Callaghan, who's also the mayor of Cessnock, says companies should have to prepare a human environmental impact statement before laying off more than 50 people. And to make sure the campaign's message gets beyond the hunter, she says the pressure should be put on Sydney by turning off the power. Well, just as the bureaucratic uh, Rambos have turned off the lamps, have turned the lamps off in our pit helmets, well, so too should we retaliate. The Hunter provides 80% of New South Wales electricity. Perhaps it's time that uh, we turn the lights out in Sydney for a couple of hours. The union says there's no timing link between the campaign launch and its bid to buy Elcom's eight coal mines. But the Federation concedes both activities have a common theme, trying to save the jobs of its 6,000 members. Scott Bevan, MBN News. A change of scenery for Cabinet, the first meeting held outside Sydney since the election. Ministerial presence set the scene for a series of announcements. The major one, the Hunter Economic Development Strategy. It's a 20-year perspective involving input from state and local governments plus the community. Its coordinating force, the Hunter Economic Development Council. Mr Griner says the strategy provides the chance for the region to control its own destiny. There's no point simply getting bitter and twisted about the fact that Canberra is screwing Newcastle. Uh, the necessity is to get on the front foot and uh, make sure that Canberra doesn't have the chance to do that. In other words, that Newcastle has a case which is beyond argument. The strategy identifies priority projects believed essential to the region's economic development. These include expanding Williamtown Airport, upgrading the port of Newcastle, establishing a technology business park and revitalising Newcastle's CBD. The aim is to broaden our economic base. In line with this, another good news announcement, this time benefiting agriculture. An investment is being made in New South Wales uh, involving uh, some $80 million and uh, with the potential to create uh, 200 jobs or just under 200 jobs at Scone. The Piggery plant will be the largest and most advanced in Australia and is a joint project between state government, a major Danish company and local pig producer Brown and Hatton. Mr Yabsley says the plant will initially process 300,000 head per year, doubling that in eight years. With Maitland being the government's most marginal seat, one could ask the question of whether this goodwill and gift-bearing visit is a timely one aimed at scoring political points. Not so, says Deputy Premier Wal Murray, who today announced a $5.4 million payment to the Hunter Valley Catchment Management Trust for the repair of flood damage throughout the region. The trust, Mr Murray says, consists of all councils, so Maitland wasn't singled out. I think uh, the recognition that goes on all over New South Wales and the fact that this government has put more money 
into natural disaster funding than any government in history recognises that there is a problem in the Hunter. The Cerro Negro exploded into life five days ago in Nicaragua, spitting massive boulders and tons of ash. Dust has blanketed the region, destroying farmland and piling up so heavily the buildings have been crushed. At least 20,000 people need help with food and shelter. The eruption is easing, but geologists say there may be more to come. In Japan, a religious festival for the truly devoted. The giant logs have been cut to build a new shrine and men ride them downhill to show their courage. This time a log steamrolled dozens of people, some were sent flying, others were crushed. One man later died. Those who ride all the way to the bottom are village heroes. Thankfully, for the male population, they only hold the festival once every six years. In New York, Elizabeth Taylor looking a million dollars and hoping to raise even more money for AIDS research. The bad old days of obesity and health problems seem way behind for the 60-year-old actress. The paparazzi were in a frenzy as she posed last night with a gold and diamond mask. It's the star piece at a benefit auction. Miss Taylor hopes it will raise two million dollars for the American AIDS Foundation. Coast to Coast Airlines is aiming its services at the North Coast business community. It will operate weekday flights between Newcastle, Coffs Harbour, Brisbane and Coolangatta. The service we're providing is basically orientated for the business people. We also do the, the tourist market as well, but basically the business people. And it's designed to get them to their airport or their destination on time when they need to. Already three airlines operate along the North Coast with at least one other expected to bid for the route. Despite the competition, coast to coast officials say there's enough demand to keep them in the air. Company officials believe scheduling flights around the business community and using ports closer to business centres will give them the edge. For example, coast to coast won't land at Brisbane Airport, but at Archerfield. The industrial centre for Brisbane is on the southwestern side. Uh, Archerfield then is, is located well, it suits the business houses quite well. Uh, BHP, A&I Corporations like that, uh, that's their main area. And by providing that service we can get their business executives maximum time for the day from the time they arrive. For a long time now, householders near the mouth of Racecourse Creek have watched in fear as the sand was etched back towards their properties. Over several years uh, it has caused a problem, down, or especially south of the creek, and uh, because of the uh, concern of the residents down here, Council commissioned a report as to what effect the uh, outlet at Racecourse Creek was having. The Tari Council has received a $130,000 state government grant which it will match dollar for dollar to build a rock-filled retaining wall to alter the direction of the outlet of the creek into the ocean. Tenders will be called as soon as the council's plan is approved by the Department of Public Works. The idea is to turn the uh, discharge from Racecourse Creek, which is a fairly large stream, of about three and a half uh, square kilometre of catchment, and to turn that directly at 90 degrees into the ocean. There will be another stage to the work, a longer term project to reshape the dunes and stabilise them with native grasses and shrubs. As we all know about the problem of unemployment, and I suppose some of you might be having difficulties with children or with marriages. But the bulk of you, I think, go along merrily year after year and uh, everything seems to be well. But whether you've got troubles this Easter time or whether you've uh, gone along well and things are good with you, um, there is no doubt that there is help available for anyone that wishes to take in the Easter message. You see, it's a miracle in some ways 
If you believe in God, that's one side of the equation, if you give him all your faith, you will find on the other side of the equation the necessary strength and support to cope with whatever life throws at you. Now that's the great hope about Easter. Whatever your material circumstances, you can get spiritual support and help that will give you a base from which you can cope with life's everyday problems. I hope you'll be able to worship uh, somewhere in your parish church or your local church because the church is there in order to help and support and sustain you. I hope too you'll have a lovely time with your family and find uh, the peace and rest, but more than anything else, the hope that comes from the Easter story. A military police patrolman from the nearby army base noticed the blaze at about 3.30. Fumes from burning polystyrene fruit boxes caused firefighters to don breathing apparatus before cutting their way into the padlocked growers market building. Police investigators assessed damage later in the morning, tracing the origin of the blaze to a faulty power box. A cold store and office area were severely damaged in the blaze along with a delivery truck and car. Stock and equipment were uninsured. Not a bad breeding ground this, the glamorous Nicola Wynn paraded the Cessnock fairways herself en route to her professional career. From under 12s up to 17 year olds, it's a 72 hole event. Doing well, 16 year old Sean Wiggett from the Pine Rivers Club, playing off a handicap of 2, he shot a 72, as did 17 year old Kurt Lynn from Belmont. In the girls, Tamworth Sky Ferno was tipped to do well, and she is. Lead the way with an 80 off the stick, one stroke behind Simone Williams from Queensland. Tookley's Samantha Finn is one shot further back. This isn't how most of us would like to spend our Easter Sunday. A one kilometre ski board paddle, another 800 metres actually in the drink, on your bike for 30 k's and then five kilometres on foot. Local athletes came out on top. The first man home, Grafton's Rod Tarrant, in a time of one hour 26.17 seconds. First woman, Wargulga's Lynn Fulton. Money raised goes to the Red Rock Corindai Surf Life Saving Club. Meanwhile, the 18th annual Byron Bay Easter Classic was held at Broken Head today. The waves were clean about one to one and a half metres, but they tended to close out heavily on the lower tide. Craig Cornish from Byron Bay qualified for the final in the Open Division. So too did Anthony McKellides from Byron Bay. From the word go, it didn't look like it was going to be one of Wally's better days. Hagen the switch and Knight's try number one. Mike McLean got a nice welcome back to Newcastle. Godden could not defuse a Lewis bomb, six all. That was as close as the Gold Coast came. The route started just after the break, a try to Wainscoe. The frustration was showing. Lewis penalised for kicking Sargent in this tackle. Coach David Waite a happy man as his charges continue to scale that Winfield Cup ladder. <laughs> 